realm. We're going to visit the unseen realm. For the next four weeks, we're going to use 20 minutes each week, roughly 20 minutes of Heiser video to do it. Why are we doing this? Uh, I said I was just going, I'm just going to stay on my notes for a minute. <laughs> this won't last long. I'm going to stay on my notes. We're at the introduction. Often, I'm, I'm laying down, why are we going to go back? This was one year and nine months ago. One year and nine months ago, we finished teaching the unseen realm. What's been going on is for the last, see, I just said I'm staying on the notes for night. <laughs> What's been happening for the last one year and nine months, pushing two years now, is as we talk Colossians and as we hear, as Rob teaches, as we walk, walk through uh, peculiar people for 16 weeks and we do all these different passages, we keep hitting the biblical writer, the, the, the Deuteronomy 32 worldview and the worldview of your biblical writers, which is a spiritual worldview. We keep hitting it, hitting it, hitting it. But because we taught it one year and eight, one year nine months ago, we didn't really go back to it. I would just go, hey, look, there's the Deuteronomy 32 worldview, and there's that. Well, we had a person in the room not too long ago who basically just said that they were not here during any of that groundwork, and we referred to reversing Hermon right here, that book. And it kind of sort of freaked them out a little bit, and they're not in the class any longer. And it just really kind of drove home to, to me that, you know, because we taught it one year and nine months ago, and now we reference it a lot. There's the, the class has changed like a lot of people in here. I mean, different folks coming and going. We're going to stop and spend 12, 12 weeks. <laughs> Sounds like one of our one chapter book studies. But we're going to spend four weeks kind of re going back through the unseen realm, laying that foundation again. I and mean, why it just means a lot to us. It's really what got us back into teaching again. Okay. At, uh, often as lay people in the church, we spend our lives searching the surface level, the surface level of theology and biblical truth. Honestly, because most of our ministers are trapped in the surface level also. For many, the moment they are exposed to a deeper level, they react in fear. That is, uh, here's what they say, things like, that is outside my norm. Can I believe this? Is this true? Fear often leads, this is Joel Travelstead coined the term, Fear often leads to discipleship stagnation. I'm going to say that. that. That was a term that day. Discipleship stagnation, not investigation. I'm going to say lovely, that again. Lovely. Fear. I'm sorry. It's lovely. Oh, thank, thank you very much. I think we've all kind of felt that at times in our lives. Discipleship stagnation. Our own disciples. Our own disciples. Discipleship stagnation that we feel stagnant in our Christian walk. Yeah, so. and, and what gets us there a lot of times, as, as you know, the folks know, I like to use the term baby Baptist. As baby Baptists, we tend to stay at that surface level, and anything that breaks that norm scares us, and that stagnates our discipleship. So, uh, often fear leads to discipleship stagnation, not investigation. What am I referring to? What's the biblical backup to that? Bereans. Bereans. They receive the word with gladness, which, by the way, is the hard part. Everybody skips that. Most Christians today do not receive the word. They receive their tradition and they stick to it. They don't receive the word. So first thing they do is they receive the word with gladness. And this was Paul talking. That that this was they received the word from Paul, then what do they do? Then they search the scriptures every day to determine whether it was true. You like that, I think. Oh, he just doesn't bring out the pom pom. <laughs> That's what it is. That you're you're, the mister used to always say that. He used to, I used to think that when he looked at Bereans, it was all about you're supposed to study the word, and then he realized it's not. It's the first part. They receive the word with gladness. That's what most people won't do. They won't there receive the word. Most Christians won't. Acts 17. Acts 17. Okay, so that's what that's sort of based off of. Let me keep going here because we got a lot to do. Okay, here are my questions. Do you believe the Bible? Yes or no? Let me see some shaking of the head. Oh, yeah, everybody in this room, y'all say y'all believe the Bible. Okay. Do you believe the Bible? Yes. If so, we should not ignore the problem passages. Digging into problem passages is where you discover the deeper truths. Problem passages are only a problem because we often do not understand the context of the biblical writer. Context is not a geographical location. And wow, they used pottery. You'll hear Missler say that. Some of the weird ways we call it. Context is definitely not reading two verses before, two verses after the scripture we're reading today. That is not context. Context is worldview. Okay, since we already said uh, be there. See, recently we mentioned Michael Heiser. Oh, I've already said that. Um, and we just kind of mentioned this book, and it kind of freaks somebody out. Okay, thus, we will spend the next four weeks reviewing for those who have not been here and introducing to those who are new the supernatural worldview of your biblical writers. Okay, the modern Christian's starting point. Here's where modern Christians, yeah. Postmodernist, modern 
thinking, post-enlightenment, post-modern, post-Christianity Christians, which is really the environment we're operating into, a post-Christian culture as Christians. The modern Christian starting point, here's why I would argue that the starting point in 21st century, 2023 modern Christians, this is kind of their starting point. For the newbies only, this is for those who weren't here one year or nine months ago or who, has, who haven't read some of Heiser stuff. For you, I'm going to ask you a question. Assuming you know nothing about Dr. Heiser's work and the Divine Council, what supernatural elements are you required to believe if you call yourself a Christian? Nobody here, Garrett, any of you people, nobody who knows Heiser's work. Like, if you don't know any of Heiser's work, the church, what, do you have to what are you required to believe as a Christian? Supernatural. Throw some out there. Throw them out there. You got two here. Don't turn to page two because we're all this. The, the resurrection. resurrection. You're required to believe. Pretty supernatural. You got to believe the resurrection or you're not a Christian. Hey, give me some more. Angels have wings, go over the angels. Angels have wings. I like that. Demons have horns. Oh, angels have wings and demons have horns. That's just what they do believe. But you're right. You kind of you better believe that. What else do you what supernatural? What about Mary? You better believe this. You better believe Mary was impregnated without a father. That pretty darn supernatural never happened since before or after. So you got it. So, that, so my point here is telling you, you believe some supernatural things because you're required to believe a few, or you can't even call yourself a Christian. So you believe in a supernatural birth. Okay. What yeah, else? How about a rock falling on people around and, 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 and giving water? Oh, in the Old Testament, a rock falling on people, a cloud by a day, burning, and a, a burning bush. And a burning bush. Yeah, we all we believe in that burning the bush. History Channel says that there was a machine that the Israelites had, and that was prepared to the Bread, the banana, it didn't actually fall from the sky. Oh, there's a mystery channel. <laughs> mystery channel, that's where we get our theology. Right. So, manna. That's a good what else do you say? What else the must you believe? Don't, we must believe that some some uh, uh, angels appeared in Bethlehem and sang to shepherds. Oh, yes. so, so, that means we do believe in some sort of angels. They sing to shepherds, apparently. <laughs> we believe in a flood. That was one. Fiery furnace. We believe that there were three men and a fourth like the Son of God. Or the Son of God uh, who appeared. Uh, yeah. So we, we believe yeah, that. that. We've heard these stories. Uh, okay, we better keep But telling. is the flood really supernatural? I don't know. It's just a first round. It's just a flood that happened. Like really the Mesopotamians have that story, and the, yeah, all the ancient river. peoples have a flood story. That was just a natural event, right? It's early flood of the Okay. Which, which matter of fact, during these four weeks, we'll talk about Lemmings. The 11 hour, um, the sun tilting the earth, and the sun reversing 11 steps, and then reversing them back. But I would say most of our modern Christians have already noticed. Which are right, you're supposed creation. to believe. Creation itself. Yeah, creation. creation itself. Okay, we got to keep moving here. I'm just going to read through my little list real fast. We got virgin birth, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. This is what the average yeah, just new Christian. The talking donkey. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> miracles of Christ. We're supposed to believe in all those miracles of Christ. Satan spoke to and tempted Jesus. So we got a Satan figure. Uh, angels sing to shepherds. Old Testament, talking donkey, flood. God created everything, but we are not sure how or when. <laughs> A few bad, a few bad spiritual beings. We gotta have a few bad ones because any good story has to have a protagonist and all that good stuff. So we gotta have a few bad ones. Satan in the garden bad. and his helpers that we call demons. But from a New Testament standpoint, we just know there's some demons out there and Jesus threw them out. How many uh, uh, ignore? We ignore all but the first three chapters of the book of Revelation. How many times have you heard a pastor? We're gonna study Revelation. And what he really means when he gets up there is we're gonna do chapters one, two, and three, and then we're out of here. How many times have you seen that? All yeah, right. But they don't ever study chapters two and three. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> because we're never the church of Thyatira. <laughs> never. Yeah, you're not yeah, that yeah, church. Right. You're not that church. Okay, so ignore all but the first three chapters of John's Revelation. The rest is only allegory. Both Ezekiel and Daniel are too hard for you to understand anyway, so don't try. <laughs> I'm giving you kind of what the general Christian sort of feels these days. The modern, young, 25-year-old Christian who sort of grew up in church maybe shows up at an evangelical church. That's kind of their starting point. Okay, we skip over or explain away most of the supernatural parts of the Bible. Because of this shallow theological understanding, we have created, a, here's, some more, here's another term I, I tried to point here, created for ourselves a package of minimal supernatural beliefs we call the gospel. 
Now this is Matt and Mer uh, Meredith's hobby horse. I told her she cannot tell this hobby horse more than a couple minutes because we've got to watch 20 minutes of video. What is the gospel? However, we severely restrict the good news. What it is for now. Yeah, go ahead. What do you want to say? What this is, is her the, hobby horse. What is the gospel? Good news. It is the, it's technically the good news. And that's and what we need to hold on to. Resurrection and salvation. <laughs> what does Paul tell us, Meredith? What where is it found? Straightforward. I want to. My voice learned. What's the, the gospel? Corinthians. Uh, First Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Paul tells you one sentence. What's the gospel? That Jesus died, died for our according sins. To the, died according to the scripture. Died for our sins according to the scripture. Was buried. Was buried. That he rose on the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel according to Paul in First Corinthians. And that's it. Because what is the gospel? What's the actual Greek word mean? Good news. The good news. All the gospel is the gospel. That's smokes. I'm going to do this way because I want to stay on this very long. But the gospel is good news. And the good news that your New Testament writers were saying is, oh, my word, the Messiah is here. He would die, buried, rose again on the third day, just like the prophets had told us. And that was the good news they were sharing. The gospel is not your theology. Their theology is a million different things about what we know about God, what we've learned about his character, how that impacts our life, how we actually make decisions on a day-to-day basis based on God's character. It's far bigger than just the gospel. The gospel is good news, and it is the gospel that is the that good news, and our placing our believing loyalty in that good news is what justifies us. Because I'm pointing here, because you remember our diagram on peculiar people? Mm -hmm. Justification was right here on the board. So right here. Pretend you see that. It justifies us. It is the critical component. But too often today in our church, we just call everything the gospel. Well, the gospel. Also, you don't say the gospel of Jesus Christ that he rose again. So we let me ask say you this. the gospel. And then all your theology is wrapped up in that one word, and we never say the word of Jesus in the name of Jesus Christ. And we, we don't, never say his name. And we don't define it. We don't define it. And so someone in the community says, oh, they're bringing... The gospel, they're building a the habitat house. Yeah, yeah. You or they're bringing to... us the gospel, they're bringing us food to eat. Or they're bringing us God, gospel, they're bringing water when we have a water to Yeah, drink. those are not That's the gospel. That's not what we're bringing. We're bringing Jesus Christ, and let's tell you about him, the person of Jesus Christ. Is, a, is my pet peeve. It's a hobby horse. She doesn't like because the gospel being left That's how you get gay Christianity yeah. and uh our doctrine's wrong because the, the world, and Joel's going to say this, the world is very happy with the word gospel. They are not happy with the name of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ brings response. When you place your believing loyalty there, you have responsibilities and duties. That's so what I, the world doesn't want. I challenge you to use Jesus Christ's name, not the gospel. And it's just a, I'm not bashing anyone, any ministry or any pastor or anything. It's just something that we as Christians have kind of eased ourselves into. And the world doesn't know what we're talking about. Again, somebody who thinks gospel, they think bringing me water, or they think we bringing know what me the good habitat news house. Is, but they don't know what the good news is. There is way more than that word itself. Our right. theology is horse, not you wrapped stop. up into the gospel. She gets upset about this. I'm going to keep going. <laughs> uh, oh, here they, go. they, they hijack the word spiritual, too. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Everyone from Hollywood is so spiritual. Joel's yeah. always big about using language correctly. And well, that's one of your I'm big about it probably yeah. because once Mr. to a less degree, but Heiser was it's huge on language. It's trained me to go, wow, language really matters. But uh, okay. Because of this shallow theological understanding, we have created for ourselves a package of minimal supernatural beliefs we call the gospel. However, we severely restrict the good news. What is it fully? We keep the gospel vague, and then we focus on our everyday lives, the here and now, missing the full picture of what the Messiah actually accomplished in that death, burial, and resurrection. All right, we create, here's the term I, I coined again, narcissistic Christianity. It's all about me. That's what we do. We keep the gospel vague in general. We strictly apply it to ourselves exclusively. We turn it into a narcissistic Christianity. How can God be my great butler in the sky and help me get my job I want? So on and so forth. Fill in the blank. Okay. We are complicit in our own deception because we are unaware of the magnitude of Christ's accomplishments at the cross and his resurrection and, the nearly, and, and are nearly ignorant of the actual spiritual warfare going on, both personally and in our culture. We miss that. We miss that spiritual warfare because we've generalized 
our theology. Okay, it's a battle and it ain't all about you. That's the takeaway. There's a battle going on personally in you and in your children, and then there's a battle going in, in the culture, which overlap. So that, <clears throat> those are the same thing. The cultural battle becomes an internal battle. And that battle, it's not about you, it's about the spiritual warfare that is in that battle. All right, we're gonna get to that. The gospel is not the totality of your theology. The culture is okay with the vague gospel. We've talked about that. Here is a partial supernatural summary of the New Testament. Mary's just gonna read some scriptures. Oh, I would love to read all of this in detail, but if you have time this afternoon, read 2 Corinthians 4. It's Paul's uh, description of perseverance in ministry. It is so good that I'm going to go just to verse 16. Therefore, we do not despair, even if our physical body is wearing out, our inner person is being renewed day by day, for our momentary light suffering is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison, because we are not looking at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. <laughs> you are literally looking at the follower of Jesus Christ, one who's bowed that knee to something that is not that you cannot physically see, the yes. supernatural world. <laughs> the unseen realm. For we, we are not looking it. at what is seen, but what it cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, <laughs> but what cannot be seen is eternal. <laughs> And then I'm going to flip over to um, Ephesians 6, which is what we all know is the battle, uh, the, the uh, spiritual warfare, putting on the armor of God. And, and he says in verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Right there. It's not against your boss. It's not against the atheist. It's not against the homosexual that lives next door. That is not who your battle is <laughs> with. Your battle are with the powers and principalities that are pushing ideology to take away God's family. Or with a fellow Christian who is captured and deceived by the false world. Who is compromised, yes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the powers, against the world rulers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. And if you look, some, some of your more modern translations will say this in the notes. If you look at any commentary, they'll tell you that the Greek there, those are rankings of spiritual beings, those I'll words that are being used. This is my textual note. The phrase world rulers of this darkness does not refer to human rulers, but to the evil spirits that rule over the world. This phrase thus stands in opposition to what follows, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens, which is serving to emphasize the nature of the forces which oppose believers, as well as to indicate the locality from where they originate. They come from the unseen realm. <laughs> Keep going. Okay, I, we actually were looking at the rankings in the New Testament and came up across all these verses. And I'm going to just read them really, really quickly. Um, but because the question you should be asking is, where was Paul getting this stuff? Where was Paul getting this stuff? Where was Paul? Where was Jesus? Where was John? Where was Jude? Where was Peter? When you read your New Testament, the Deuteronomy 32 supernatural worldview of your biblical writers is everywhere in your New, Te uh, New Testament we've been trained to not see it. <laughs> so I'm going to quickly go through. This is um, verse by verse. Ephesians 3.10 says that the church, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God may not, might now, now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. So the, so God, the, the rulers and authorities in the supernatural world, in our terminology, the angels, the angels in the supernatural world are learning of the plan of God by watching, watching it play out in humanity. That'll freak you out. That's just a weird concept. That's what Paul tells us. Keep Colossians 2.15, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Uh, so that tells there, Paul's talking about these rulers and authorities that Christ triumphed. Well, that Christ triumphed through his death, burial, and resurrection, rulers and authorities. Well, why were they rulers and authorities, and how did they get there? Apparently they were corrupt, because Christ triumphed over them. Just interesting thoughts. You should ask yourself these questions when you read Paul's writings. What's he talking about? Mark 13, 25, this is in the Gospels. And the stars, which is the name for heavenly beings. heavenly beings, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. 1 Peter 3, 22, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, powers, having been subjected to him? So, and I love the way that in your New Testament writers, they always say angels, authorities, and powers. What they're trying to do is say, 
hey, 21st century Christians realize that they're not all angels. There's an entire, where's the word up here, Meredith? There's an entire taxonomy. Well, anybody know what a taxonomy is? Some of you teachers and scientists. A taxonomy is nothing more than a classification system. Your Bible has, especially your Old Testament, has a wonderful <laughs> supernatural taxonomy that because of our translations being translated multiple times now in English, we tend to lose it. We just don't see it. And then, of course, Romans 8, 38. For I'm sure that neither death, nor life, nor angel, angels, nor rulers, nor they are again, separating angels from come, rulers, nor powers can separate you from the love of God. Yeah, he's going to tell us this. How that hides your But why, why does Paul keep separating angels from rulers and all that? Because angels is not a being. What is an angel? It's a messenger. It's a job description. It's all it is. Anybody in the supernatural world can be an angel. But that's also why a person can be an angel. Because you notice there are places in the Bible where a human is called an angel. Why? Because he's being used as a messenger. An angel is nothing more. The angel is not a creature with wings. An angel is nothing more than a job description. What is your job description? You have a job description. Angel is a job description of a supernatural being. Okay. Are we at the place? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Whew. Where am I? Modern. Oh, modern Christians are believing skeptics. I like that word. This is from Heiser. I like that word, believing skeptics. That's really what, because we're postmodern and we've adopted so much of our modern materialistic thinking within the church, we are believing, we're believers, but we're believing skeptics. You see this so much in your young pastors today. They'll read the Old Testament. They'll read the first of all. They'll throw out the Old Testament. Don't even read that. The New Testament, if it's something that is that is strange or unusual, uh, uh, they're okay with skeptical. Oh, we can believe in a thousand years. What? Hey, well, I won't go into examples. But you, today's average Christian appears to be a believer who's actually a skeptic. They're believing skeptics. Let's talk about that. Will you allow the Bible to speak for itself, or will you be skeptical of the Bible's supernatural claims and, the, and fearful of the ramifications? Play what it means to interpret the Bible. This is just a quick little 22 seconds. Now, these things always mess up, but we think we figured out why they won't mess up this time. <laughs> Search it each time as opposed to saving it, it tends to work. We used to save these and they just. We're going to be in trouble if we do all that groundwork. You want to say Heiser or whatever these are going to Sorry, guys. Yeah, okay. While she's doing this real quick, when it comes up, while she's doing this, I'm going to tell you this. Did you hand these out? Okay, just to get ready for the next four weeks of this, uh, what I gave you is the, the little gray sheet. Is it, We're going to be watching, that's not what this is, we're going to watch a video of Dr. Heiser, Dr. Michael S. Heiser being interviewed by Sean McDowell. McDowell. Everybody know Sean McDowell? A lot of you guys know him. Everybody know his father? Who was his father? Josh, Josh McDowell. Everybody knows Josh McDowell. Incredible... Um, uh, evangelical, apologetics, written a million books and all that kind of stuff. Sean is his son who has become a PhD in apologetics following after his father, after a serious crisis in his faith, which is phenomenal. If you ever want to hear kind of how he had a crisis and went to his dad and said, I don't know if I believe all the things you've been teaching all these years. And he walked, anyway, it's just a neat story. But Sean is Josh McDowell's So how do you run the company with only 20% of the staff? <laughs> That's not Sean McDowell. <laughs> So, okay, so what I, while she's trying to find that, 
What that is, that's a bio. I only made, did we, did we hand out any of these yet? I'm gonna hand these out. This is Michael Heiser's bio. It is 11 pages. So I, I just could not, uh, this is me, I could not waste that much paper. So I made five of them. If you want to take it with you, pass it around. But this has dozens, if not hundreds, of peer-reviewed article references that he's peer-reviewed in, 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 in biblical theology and literature all around the world. And it gives you his background. What biblical books That's him. were put together. So y'all can just kind of pass his glance at it. Other books want, were. If you want. Because the people putting them together were really good at it. Yeah, that's not the one we're talking They knew about. what they were doing. That's Michael Hyde. They were the literate class. They're professional. Do you want to do the other one? Yeah, I mean, the other one is the same. You're just having trouble with that. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. Bible is an ancient collection of books. It's not just one book, and all of you know that. In the English Protestant Bible, it's 66 books written by men who lived at a specific time, who came from a specific region, a specific culture who shared a worldview and they were prepared by God for the task. Okay, that's Bible is an eight. What was the name of the other one? Did you found it now? Uh, the other one was, uh, uh, where is it? <coughs> oh, what it means to interpret the Bible in context? I'm just going to video, skip all that, let's just go straight to the interview. Okay, sorry. We're going, I'm going to one day get the uh, church guys in here to get us some better signal in here. We're not always struggling with internet signal. How to escape the heat if you don't have an air conditioner? Yeah, that's very important. This only takes five minutes. <laughs> Can demons read this what is the mind can Christians be demon-possessed? Today we're going to take a look at some of the most common questions people ask about the supernatural. I'm going to let her pause it because it might mess up. This, this is subtitled The Pokemon Eye. Kaiser's going to explain this world at all why he of, went uh, down this path. Unseen realm. You will recognize the name Dr. Michael Heiser. I have his book Demons right in front of me. Read it twice and each time I walked away going, Wow, how did I not understand that? Even though I've been to seminary and gotten the doctorate, how have I missed some of these things? Really, really eye-opening. No. Dr. Heiser, thanks so much for coming on the show. Yeah, absolutely. I, I should tell your audience I had the very same experience. <laughs> you know, just, I, I was a doctoral student before I read into things like Psalm 82 and the Deuteronomy 32 worldview, and I asked myself the exact same question. How in the world could I have never seen this stuff before? Now, and now I have a bit of an answer for that, but back then it was like I was kind of shell shocked. Well, it felt like reading your book, you were kind of going on a journey a little bit and taking us with you in terms of the things that you discovered going back to the original language, Second Temple literature, just going deeper than even the English writings, which loses some of the nuance of understanding demons and angels, etc. We're going to unpack that. We're going to take some questions from all of you who are joining us, stuff you wanted to know about demons. Uh, but before we get there, there's some groundwork we need to lay in terms of why so many Christians and also many non-Christians have some unbiblical ideas about demons. Uh, first, if you're new to the channel, make sure you hit subscribe because we've got some other interviews coming up, including one with Billy Howell, who'll be talking about the case for the demonic realm. Today we're going to look at theology. That's going to come up. We're going to look at the evidence that demons are real even outside of the Bible. And a special interview this Thursday with Richard Bach, one of the leading New Testament scholars on the eyewitness accounts of Jesus. Uh, for now, Dr. Heiser, one of the first questions I thought is you've written at least three books that I'm aware of on angels, demons, and unseen realm. Why would you write on this world of all the things that you could study? I was... I was providentially poked in the eye that's by the God. I mean, that's, that's really the best answer I could give you. 
you know, it, as I relate in Unseen Realm, that, that's, that book preceded these other two. And Unseen Realm is sort of a, a Genesis to Revelation overview of biblical theology with an eye toward how the unseen world intersects with the human world intentionally. Okay. It's for, um, and that was provoked by an experience I had as a doctoral student, um, just sitting in church, you know, one Sunday morning and killing some time with a friend who was also in the Hebrew department, and I don't know what the discussion was. I can't remember what we were talking about, but the way it ended was life changing. He, he just handed me his Hebrew Bible and said, "You need to read Psalm 82 in Hebrew." Did that happen in church? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and you find out there that God Elohim is is castigating, excoriating a group of gods. You know, other Elohim, Elohim Nitzav Ba'ana El. God stands in the divine assembly, the care of Elohim, Yishpah, in the midst of the gods, midst of the Elohim, he passes judgment. And I, I read that. Elohim is like, being spiritual being. That's, that's how they're pantheon. I mean, I had no other word for it. And it was like, it was just shocking. It wasn't hard Hebrew, it's just right there. And, you know, that took me down a, a, a certain path, you know, providentially again, I, I, I was fortunate to, after I asked the initial question, how, how did I never see this before? I mean, I'm not a newbie. I'm a doctoral student you know, in, in a Hebrew you know, Bible program at a major university. I've taught 15 classes. I've taught five years in a Bible college level. I have two master's degrees. You know, how, how did I not see this? I've been to seminary. I've been to Bible college. You know, and, and my second thought, again, providentially was, I'll bet Jesus knew this song. Huh. I'll bet the apostles knew it. Interesting. There must, there must be a way to parse this. And that set me on a course. And now, you know, in hindsight, I'm not making this up. This is not exaggeration. Looking back, I had one clock hour, not credit hour, <laughs> clock hour, 60 minutes. In 15 years of undergraduate and graduate training, 60 minutes on angels and demons. Interesting. Now, it that kind of the glass, pastors and Bible teachers. It, it teaches you something off. passively. Like, this stuff can't be important or else they'd spend more time on it. And here I was sitting in a church looking at Psalm 82 in Hebrew and frankly just getting poked in the eye. I mean, you get to, you know, you know how it is. You, know, you get to, that, to a doctoral program, you've been in ministry for a while, you kind of get the sense that, okay, I got the lay of the land here. You know, I, I, I know most, you know, I know more Bible than most people in church. I can navigate questions. You know, I, I feel called to do this. And, you know, I'm, I'm on the right path. And, and all of a sudden it's like, you don't know, you don't know anything. Wow. <laughs> It's like, you, you know, nothing, you know, this, this is so fundamental. God. Okay. I, I remember sitting there thinking, I got a dissertation to write. You know, how, how in the world can I, I, I can't let my mind just get, get drawn by this, by questions like monotheism. I mean, you know, I'm supposed to have this figured out. And it was, it was just, it just stopped me in my tracks. And so one, once I got into it, I couldn't give up. I, I had the answer to this. Then I started to run into Second Temple period, intertestamental period text. Gotcha. It got into the into the supernatural world, and, and and the fact that well we have we have a, you know the Satan figure, you know, and we've got Genesis six, we've got what happened three rebellions, not just one. Where did the, where did where did Judaism get this crazy idea that demons are you know were the disembodied spirits of Nephilim? I mean, it's all over the Dead Sea Scrolls. And, like, what are they thinking, you know? But I, I hadn't been exposed to any of it. Zero. Okay? And, and that just sort of sucked me down the rabbit hole, or you know, got me into the, into the vortex. And, and I, I couldn't give it up. So it became, you know, part of my dissertation. You know, my, my dissertation was on the, the divine assembly, the divine council in gotcha. Second Temple Jewish literature and, and later texts in the Hebrew Bible. And, and it, it, now I look back on it and think, this is so fundamental, what I now call the Divine Council worldview and the Deuteronomy 32 worldview. This is so fundamental to biblical theology 
that once you see it, you can't unsee it. It just shows up everywhere. And, and, and the wonderful thing is it, the Bible's filled with all these weird passages that we as moderns, you know, we're, we are, whether we like to, to admit it or not, we are believing skeptics because we were raised in a modern world, post-enlightenment. And so we don't readily, we're not predisposed to a, a full supernatural worldview. As Christians, we tend to be very selective about this. And I'm not talking about charismatic, you know, charismania stuff. Sure. I'm not charismatic. You know, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have any background in that. What I'm talking about here is we find it somehow intellectually respectable to believe in things like a trinity and the incarnation and the hypostatic union and the deity of Christ. But we can't believe in things like Genesis 6 or like real principalities and we can't like affirm Daniel 10's theology, you know. Right. We, you know, we balk at all these passages and it's like, look, look, fellas, they come from the same book. Okay? How can this be intellectually coherent to embrace this set of things and reject this set of things? And I, I was I was confronted by that question. That, that's just I was. You know, again I I took, I took a good poke in the eye, actually a few pokes in the eye, again by Providence, that, that I had to cross the Rubicon, so to speak. And this is gonna sound so so simple, maybe even simplistic, but, but I remember just sitting there as a doctoral student thinking, you know, I, I have to make a decision whether I'm going to read the Bible through the eyes of the people that God produced, God prompted to produce the thing, their worldview, and the worldview of the people they were writing to that were alive at the same time. I have to decide to either do that or be content with filtering the Bible through my own tradition. And I liked my tradition. There was nothing wrong with it. You know? but, but it was like, it, and I knew that if, if you go down this road, it's it's going to cost you some friendships. It's going to cost you, you know, maybe a job. It's going to, it's not the norm. Just the simple idea. I mean, Christians talk about interpreting the Bible in context all the time. Oh, look, they used lamps back in, in Israel. Oh, they had pots and pans, and, you know, they had cisterns. Okay, okay I get it. But, but worldview is a huge deal. Okay, the biblical writers, do, they were not us. They are not us. They don't look at the world the way we do. They are predisposed to a supernaturalistic worldview. And they confront us in scripture. To me, this, is, this has become an issue of, of biblical authority. You know, am I going to submit my post-enlightenment 21st century intellectual worldview? To the worldview of the biblical writers, can I can I do that? And it was it was a little scary. That's that's a great question because I I sense in the book there's a real honesty and willingness to say, hey, where does this lead? Even if it makes us uncomfortable, and and I appreciate that. Let's jump into the beginning. You mentioned a whole lot of things. I kind of want to want to unpack a little bit for our viewers here. And one is, it seems like we read back stuff from the New Testament into the Old Testament that probably wasn't there at that time. And one of the distinctions you make early in the book is that the word demons only appears three times in the Old Testament, depending on how we translate certain right. words. Why is that important to understand what's going on in the Old Testament? And what are some of the different ways that these evil spirits are described? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we, have a, we have a significant problem with terminology. I, mean, I, I, I do this on the gate in the angels book and I do a little bit of it in the demons book as well but the Old Testament has a very rich vocabulary for what's going on both the good guys and the bad guys that we lack almost entirely because of, of the flow of history and, and things like the Old Testament the Hebrew Bible getting translated into Greek and then the New Testament also being in Greek, so most of the time they quote the Old Testament, they're using that translation. A lot of the nuancing is just lost. And, and, and this is a, a classic example. Shadim is the word you're referring to in the Old Testament. It's not a demon like, like you would think in, in the Gospels. 
It doesn't describe that. It's rather, it can be, and I think it is, in those contexts in the Old Testament, a territorial entity. And the reason that makes the best sense is it's used in Deuteronomy 32 in the context of, again, the Deuteronomy 32 worldview that we can talk about. But all of, you know, that's just one example. You know, what do you do with that? I mean, how do you know unless you look? You're a reader of the English Bible. And even if you are, let's just go down that trajectory. Let's say you're just a reader of the English Bible and you run across the word demons a few times, but they don't possess anybody. They're never cast out of anybody. I mean, it's a very logical question to ask, hey, you know, if there's no possessions in the Old Testament and exorcisms, why in the world when Jesus showed up and he starts doing this, do they consider this a sign of his messiahship? Where did that come from? There's no Old Testament precedent for it, or so we think. Again, because we're, we're, we're steered in one direction by, again, the way English translations are what they are, but there's just a lot of terminology that's lost. And in, in the end, what I try to articulate in the books is that just generally you have three buckets, three terminology buckets. You've got terms for the heavenly host that describe what a member of the heavenly host is. Those would be your ontological terms. Okay, what it is. Things like spirits. Elohim is actually one of these terms. It's a, it's a generic term to describe any disembodied member of the spiritual world. Okay, so there's lots of Elohim. We don't have polytheism in Psalm 82. We have, a, we have a spiritual world populated with lots of spiritual beings. Sometimes they're called Rukot spirits. Sometimes they're called Elohim. Sometimes they're called holy ones. You know, whatever. There's this vocabulary that tells you what it is. You know, and in that world, only Yahweh is distinct. He's what I call species unique. Only he has certain attributes that are assigned to him by biblical writers and denied to all other yeah. elements. Yeah. You know, that's, that's important. But this, then you have another bucket. Then you have terms of rank and hierarchy. Sons of God is one of these. You know, it's, it's language drawn from the royal court. Uh, but, you know, the, the kings would, would give their relatives the best jobs, you know, family members, you know, the most important, significant positions. This is all it is, you know. Then you have a third bucket that describes role or function. This is where you actually get angel. It's a messenger, cherub, a throne guardian, guards sacred space. Same thing for seraphim. Seraphim and cherubim are not angels. They're just not job descriptions of any given member of the heavenly host. This is why angels really are never depicted with wings, because cherubim and seraphim are not angels in an Israelite world, okay? But in our world, we smash all this vocabulary together. Gotcha. And the white hats are angels, and the black hats are demons, because that's the way we're taught in, in, in church. That's the way we're taught you know, in church tradition, you know, throughout church history. Uh, so a lot of it gets lost because of language. A lot of it gets lost because of worldview. When you get to the bad guys, you realize that, okay, we've got one rebellion in Genesis 3, a supernatural being. You know, we know the story of the garden. Genesis 6, you've got another set. Okay, now you've got a set, sons of God, that transgress you know, the boundary of heaven and earth. They produce Nephilim. When they die, then their spirits, you know, one of the terms that, that are referred to, used in the Old Testament of the descendants of the Nephilim is Rephaim. You actually see them in Sheol, in the underworld in various Old Testament passages. That's actually where the Second Temple Jews that you thought were crazy, where they get this notion that demons are the disembodied spirits of dead Nephilim, dead giant clans. That's where you get it in a few passages in the prophets. And then you got a third set. Okay, what happens at Babel? When the earth is divided up according to the number of the sons of God, according to Deuteronomy 32, 8 and the Dead Sea Scrolls. So you got three sets of bad guys and the middle set actually breaks into two. I mean, you, you, you know, it's like it's a whole taxonomy that we are completely unfamiliar with, completely. And the reason it matters is when is you, if you have this worldview as a Jew in the first century, you expect the Messiah to show up and be master and corrector and reverser of all three. There's more going on than Jesus the cross. Is. What Jesus says and what he does in certain places at certain times in his ministry, those places and, and, and the terminology, they, they have backstories to them. 
you know, that run deep into the Old Testament. And in some of these, you know, they, he actually picks very specifically certain groups of these to say a certain thing or be at a certain place and do something. We have lost all of that. Again, because we don't live in this world. We're, we're taught as moderns to not see anything supernatural going on in Genesis 6. We never see what's going on in Babel because most of our Bibles at Deuteronomy 32.8 do not follow the Dead Sea Scrolls. So we, we miss two out of the three rebellions. We have an incomplete and confused you know, taxonomy. We, we don't know the vocabulary, but here we are. Here we, here we are with my 60 minute, my one clock hour wow. of exposure to this in 15 years of higher education. And I look back at it now, well, it's no wonder. It's no wonder. And, and, and you know, again, what I, what I try to do in these books is scholars, you know, the, the, the text geeks, okay, Let, let's just be honest with, with you know, who I am and who, who these kind of people are, okay? You, you know, the Hebrew people and the Greek people, everything I just described is like, yeah, we all know that because we study the primary sources. There's nothing new here, and, and there isn't, but it's almost entirely new to the average person in church or someone who really wants to get in, into the text of scripture. And so I view my task as trying to take this content, this high peer reviewed academic content and making it decipherable you know, to people with an eye you know, toward, toward how the natural and the natural world intersect intentionally in biblical theology. Well, I, th I think you do that well. All right, that's the first one. That lays the groundwork. That's why we called it a poke in the eye. Because he had a poke in the eye, serious pokes in the eye, and sitting down a trajectory, which of course thousands, if not millions, of people have read it. Right? And of course, there are many, many, many other scholars who've run down the same line. Matter of fact, if you ever listen to his podcast, he's passed away now, by the way, recently, very recently, uh, of pancreatic cancer. But his naked, the naked, the naked Bible podcast. There are four hundred something episodes I've heard, every single one of them. I listened to over two hundred and fifty episodes before I ever talked the first thing on this. So it's not like I read an article in the news uh, on the on the one of his articles and ran to go tell you all see this. I listened to 250 hours before we ever taught any of this. It's, it's just amazing stuff. But anyway, all right, let me get to it because I know we got to go. Okay, superlatives. This is why you get these superlatives in the Old Testament. Do you ever ask yourself this? It's not just literary, you know, hyperbole. The Most High God. What does that imply? The most high Elohim. That implies there's somebody else. <laughs> Why do you get this? He is the most high and he constantly claims the most high, the most high. God above all gods, little g gods. Why do you get that all through the Old Testament? Wonder why that's there. What is the very first of the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt have no other gods, Elohim, before me. He's not talking about puppets. Yes. So have no other gods before me. Examine Psalm 82 in the Hebrew using the Blue Letter Bible. So quickly, um, y'all know I love this app. It's called Blue Letter Bible. Let me say this real quick while she's doing this. This is why you guys can be Hebrew scholars. You've got technology now that will take a scripture, throw it over into Hebrew, and you can see the word Elohim. You can see everything he's talking about. I screenshot this just to give you an idea if you're a Hebrew scholar and somebody's sitting in your church on a Sunday night and says, here, read this in Hebrew. And you can see it says God, Elohim, spelled that way. Okay. Standeth in the congregation of the mighty among Elohim. See, the word Elohim is used both. It's used for God the Father, who we know as God, and it's used for all those others that are in his presence in this passage. Because Elohim is not a proper noun. It's nothing more than a member of the spiritual being. And you have to know what the context is to determine what Elohim is it talking about. So this is what blew his mind. Read Psalm 82. I won't read the whole thing. But God stand, God Elohim stands in the congregation of Elohim. And your Bible says little means God. there was a divine council, a congregation, some say council. Then go to uh, Psalm 82, 6. This is Elohim God, the one true God, saying, I have said, you Elohim, you gods, Elohim. you gods and children of the Most High. That's their other title that you heard it say, children of God, children of the Most so High So what does God. that immediately tell you when you read that in Hebrew? It immediately tells you, oh, God had a family. Yeah, before we were created, God had a family. The angels existed before we did. Keep going. Okay. That's oh, is that okay. What we'll do next week is we'll get into this a little bit. What's interesting about this passage is he's judging these children. He's and judging. he's saying that these spiritual beings will die like men. 
Wow. Very interesting. Very interesting. Okay. Rhetorical question. Will you be intellectually, biblically honest or not? Most Christians have chosen to not be Koreans, resulting in the sacrifice. This is what drives me crazy. I'm not going to jump on this point for long, but resulting in the sacrifice of our teenagers and young adults to college professors and cultural influencers. We have two. Like the, I gotta, can I get an amen? Maybe. I'm going to say it again. <laughs> resulting in the sacrifice of our teens and young adults to college professors and cultural influencers because they know this stuff. They dilly dally and play around in the spiritual world and it's perverted. And they'll take your baby Baptist child, bring him into the first year English professor, and tell him everybody's got a flood story. Yours just made it up like the rest of them did. It's all a myth. And they go, wow, nobody ever told me about all these other flood stories in my youth group. No joke. And, and we talked about this class. There are lots of reasons why those, what, the, what a polemic means, and what our biblical writers were doing were correcting the record. Blah, blah, blah. But okay. I, I, I'm going to also say the practical reason, too, for knowing that there is a spiritual battle going on is because there's a spiritual battle going on, and what we see is temporary, and what we don't see is eternal. And, I, I mean, we have college freshmen in here. We have college in, students in our household. You all have children. This is a portal to spiritual darkness. I mean, we all have to use it. We all have to use it. But I'm just saying, I see it every day. The anxiety, the depression, the spiritual battle, the self-hatred of, of we as imagers of Christ. I see it every day in my practice and with my friends and families and extended families. And it, there's a spiritual battle going on. If we don't even know that it's real, then we are not arming ourselves with the one thing that we have the fight. Yes. Yes. If we do not the pocket God. The pocket God. If we do not instruct and teach our children in a biblical worldview that includes the entire Bible, the world will. This this is the portal. And they will be taught that the days of sheltering a child are over. You know this. Those days are long gone. If we don't do it in these four walls, this little four wall device will do it. They cannot avoid it. Okay, where am I, Mary? We got down here. Oh, uh, when we talk, when we walk away from full scripture, uh, we have decided to keep ourselves and our youth ignorant, sheep to the slaughter. This little mistress question. I love the whole mistress question. What is our biggest problem today? If you ask the average Christian, I would say Christian. On the street. On the street. What is our biggest problem today? Ignorance or apathy? You. What's the response? Yes. I don't know, and I don't care. <laughs> yes. Let me say it again. What's our biggest problem? Ignorance or apathy? I don't know, and I, I don't, don't care. care. <laughs> and that's what happens in the church. And that's why this kind of stuff scares them, and that's why a full book, you'd rather stay in your filtering the Bible through a tradition instead of letting it speak for itself. In training up the next generation to be warriors in a battle, not good Christians hunting a good job. <laughs> and if you ever sat in a pew on Sunday morning and say, I got this, I got it all, I understand it all, you're missing out on so much. There's so much more to learn. There's so much more deep spiritual truths that we don't quite understand in the word, the gospel. Yeah. Uh, will you submit your worldview to that of the Bible, the Bible's worldview, or will you? Fear your Bible and run from it. That's the ultimate question. That's what, that's what Hydra said today because I had to make a decision sitting there getting ready to write my dissertation. Well, I just continue filtering the Bible through my own tradition or will I actually read it for what it really says? And that's the breakthrough. Not everybody's going to do that. I don't even think everybody should necessarily. We're not all Hebrew biblical scholars. I think it's helpful. Okay, next week we're going to pick up, we're going to go into the Deuteronomy 32 world, what it actually is. Pray us out of here. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come before you and praise you and thank you for being the most high God, the one true God, uh, but in a world that, that we don't understand, a spiritual world that we battle in every day. Lord, we know that you have already preached to the captives. You have already shown us that we have life after death. You've conquered death. You've conquered this world. And we know that the end game, we know that uh, you want a family and our job is to to disciple others as we are going. Lord, help us to do that. Help us to recognize the spiritual battles that are on our cells and our families every day and help us to take up the cross and bear it for you, Jesus Christ, who died for us. In Jesus' name, amen. And if 